today I'm reading 1 Corinthians um, 14. And it says, Follow after charity and des desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, for, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Now brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation, or by knowledge, or by prophesying, or by doctrine, and even things without life giving sound, whether pipe, pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sound, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? for you shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Even so ye for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else, when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say, Amen, at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth, understandeth not what thou sayest? For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank God, my God, I speak with tongues more than ye all. Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also, than ten thousand words in an unknown tongue. Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In the law it is written with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. And yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore tongues are a sign not, for, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. How is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation? Let all things be done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course. And let, the, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and God, and to God. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What, came the word of God out from you, or came unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. So, the verse that stands out to me out of 1 Corinthians 14 is verse 26. Oh. 
<sighs> and it says, How is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation? Let all things be done unto edifying. So, um, the focus of this chapter is talking about order in the church and that things that are not disorderly, like having someone speak in a different uh, language, uh, that those aren't supposed to happen in the church because they don't edify. And the goal of the church is to edify. And here we see that he says, How is it then, brethren? When you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. And so these are the different things that people are contributing to the church. <clears throat> but the goal here, the key, is let all things be done unto edifying. And so the he says that again. We see edify up in 17, we see it in, uh, where was it, 12, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church, edifying the church, and edify is similar to building up, or <clears throat> admonishing, or something like that. Um, It's like an edifice. When they say uh, something is an edifice, it's like a structure or a building or a big towering, um, like, structure. I, I know it, it's kind of like I just used the same word to define itself. Um, but when it applies to the church, it makes sense because we are the temple of God. Let's go to... Uh, Ephesians 2 19 through 22 now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So we are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And all the building, we are the building, fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. And so this is what we are. We're built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, the same foundation that the apostles and prophets are built upon, which is Jesus Christ. Not that they are the foundation. It doesn't say that they are the foundation. It says that we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, which is Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. The cornerstone is the foundation. Um, and so we're not going to draw from that specific verse that we're somehow built upon what uh, prophets did in the Old Testament because the church is a mystery and um, it was not revealed unto the prophets. Uh, it was hidden from them. That's actually what the next verse in Ephesians is about, uh, or the next chapter in Ephesians chapter 3. It talks about the mystery of the church. Um, it calls it right here, it's a revelation that was made known to him, uh, a mystery. It was in other ages not known unto the sons of men, but is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So, um, anyway, so what we're looking at is the fact that we are the habitation of God. Let's go to Ephesians 4. Um, and here we see the word edify come in. Yeah, twice. Uh, two key places. Let's go from 11 down to 16 in Ephesians 4. And it says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And so again, we're talking about like the prophesying, the preaching of the word of God. Um, like it was talking about in 1 Corinthians 14, or yeah, 1 Corinthians 14. 
and the goal of these apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers is the perfecting of the saints, the work of the ministry, the edifying of the body of Christ. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. It's interesting that it says measure of the stature because it said in the previous chapter, um, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. So fitly framed together, kind of like a measure, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. And here it says, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Um, where was it? Here. The measure unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sight of men and cunning craftedness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working, and the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And so again, we see in the same context, he's talking about us coming into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, growing up, just like it said in the previous chapter, which groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, or not the previous chapter, two chapters before, um, that we are, uh, where was it? I need that sidebar to go away. Okay. Right here. May grow up into him into all things, which is the head, even Christ. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and measure of every part, maketh increase of the body into the edifying of itself in love. And so it's linked with the uh, growing up into him and the same terminology that we see with building up and this is just in the context of the bible itself but i mean when we look at the english english language um edify is linked with edifice and it's com it's linked with the building up um and so what's what's the purpose here that when we talk about what a church is for and what happens in a church and I'll, I'll elaborate that on on that later um, it is this for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ and specifically for the edifying of the body of Christ because both of the first two are part of the edifying of the body of Christ and so when we go back to 1 Corinthians 14 and we, he says, let all things be done unto edifying, and seek, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that me, you may excel to the edifying of the church, that um, this is the goal, that we're supposed to be growing into an holy temple in the Lord, that we're supposed to be growing up into him in all, in all things, which is the head even Christ, that we're supposed to come unto a perfect man, in the unity of the faith and, the, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And we've gone over this in the past about what that is, how we're supposed to be becoming Christ, to let our conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, and um, to know that uh, we are members of the body of Christ, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And, uh, you know, there's an entire study in that about what the church is, uh, but the function is that we're supposed to be maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And so, all the body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working and the measure of every part. The effectual working is interesting because it says in First Thessalonians 
For this cause also think we God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God which ye heard of us, you receive it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So the effectual working in the measure of every part, every part is every, every person, every individual. And the effectual working has to take place in every single part. They have to be believing the truth as it is in truth and not as the word of men. And it's not just every part, but it's the joints that are between every part. Combated by that which every joint supplies. So the connections between the different members, how they're ministering and perfecting and edifying each other. And it maketh increase of the body as a whole unto the edifying of itself and love. And I think I talked about this in a recent one about love, giving yourself, forgiving yourself, each other, um, how we're supposed to walk in love as Christ also loved us. Um, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that because I've already gone over that. Um, it doesn't hurt, it's just that I'm trying to aim in a different, a little bit of a different direction this time. So, everything that takes place in the church, this, these are very practical terms. All you've got to do is look at each word and think about what it refers to in the context of the Bible. We know that every part is every person who has been given a part, place, um, in the body of Christ, every member. And we look at joint, it's the joints between the different parts. We've got to understand it in the context of the analogy that um, he's using. So if it's for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, and like it said in 1 Corinthians uh, 14, let all things let all things be done unto edifying, that is what a church is for. It's for edification and more specifically perfecting the saints work of the ministry and edifying of the body of Christ. And if a church is doing anything outside of this then um, it's not the church. We know that a church is uh, not physical. Just because members are meeting physically uh, and having joint joints where they're laboring for each other, or maybe not not necessarily even physically, maybe it's like they're uh, praying for each other, or sending each other letters, or sending each other support uh, without actually physically being around each other, it could be anything. Um, we know that a church isn't physical. Now, members meet, uh, and did, in fact, the Church of Ephesus was a church in, inside the house of Aquila and Priscilla, as I've uh, talked about in the past, at least from what we, I know, from what we know from the the epistles given to us, uh, it was a church in the house of Aquila and Priscilla because he writes, he left them in Ephesus uh, when he continued on his journey and they stayed at Ephesus, and then in Romans we see that he's writing to the church that is in their house, um, and so it's logical to conclude that the church that is at Ephesus is the church, the same church that was in the house of Aquila and Priscilla. So, uh, just because there's a physical meeting though does not mean that that is all that the church is. It's, it is much more. It's everything and that's described here and all throughout the book of Ephesians, all throughout 1 Corinthians and uh, Timothy and anywhere else that's mentioned like Colossians. Um, and really, the, in all of the doctrine given to us, it describes different aspects of what the church is. Um, so it's not just one place, and it's not just one thing. Uh, and so I'm going to put this in real simple terms. I go to church. If I go to church on Sunday morning, what do I do? I go to a building. I sit in a pew, I listen to a preacher preach, and then maybe we sing some hymns, and maybe I eat lunch with some of them, and then I go home. And then maybe I go do the same thing on Wednesday, maybe there are no hymns, maybe it's just like a Bible study and we pray, uh, and then every now and then they do an event, like 
baseball or like a charity event or volunteering or something um, and so that is our modern concept of what a church is now let's just start by saying that's completely messed up to begin with because we see clearly that a church is not just a physical place and it's not just doing a certain thing especially a certain thing that comes from traditions that are not of God they're Catholic traditions developed by the Roman Catholic Church all of these traditions the pews the altar calls the pulpit everything about the modern Christian culture comes from the Roman Catholic Church even though people deny it, it's that's just the way it is. It's not at all biblical. There are biblical aspects. I mean, people can use uh, these traditions um, because we have liberty in Christ, but often they are not using them to serve Christ. They're being servants to them because they think that that's what is pleasing to God, when in fact it's not. We just go to... Colossians 3 to see this where it talks at the very end Colossians 2 I mean where it talks at the very end of the chapter about the rudiments of the world and the commandments and doctrines of men and again he says wherefore if you be subject wherefore if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world why is the living in the world are you subject to ordinances touch not taste not handle not which all are to perish with the using these are the ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are, all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men. So men command and ordain, touch not, taste not, handle not. So all these traditions are of men, not of God, which things have indeed a show of wisdom, so they appear wise in will worship, they appear wise and they appear to of your free will to worship God, you say, oh, I'm giving this as a free will sacrifice to God, and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to satisfying of the flesh. So it's like Lent. You give up something you feel good about yourself because you're giving this thing for God. But it's the tradition of men. And um, there are many aspects of this. It's not just Lent. It's a lot of things about the modern church. But so having got a, the con having laid the groundwork that the modern day church is not biblical at all uh, and we have to rethink what a church is because we are so affected by the traditions that have been laid upon us by people in the past who used false doctrine in their own wisdom and their own pride and their own arrogance and their own mind and their own flesh to try and figure out what a church is supposed to look like instead of going to wholesome words, which are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's just humor it for a second and pretend that the church, modern day churches, are actually somewhat biblical. So, even if there were, any anything and everything that occurs in that physical church is supposed to be for the edifying of the body of Christ. It's supposed to be, let all things be done unto edifying. I guarantee you right now, you go into any physical church and just stay there for 15 minutes, you're going to immediately start to see stuff that is not edifying. You're going to see just clicks, you're going to see judgment that is not based off of truth, you're going to see culture of the world that has crept in, traditions of men that are edifying. It's just... <clears throat> You're going to see basically everyone behaving the way that they, th they feel they're behaving in a holy manner, but in reality they're behaving, you know, just the same way that they would in the world, fleshly. They're serving the flesh. It's not edifying each other. It's not serving each other in love. Uh, make it increase of the body into edifying of itself in love. But that's not a surprise, because we just saw exactly why the modern day church, and I say church with quotation marks, because it's not truly a church. Um, it's just a group of people. And let's just ignore the perversion of the word church for a second, um, where people have basically reduced it 
from all meaning because the church refers to the body of Christ. It doesn't refer to, refer to a group of people. We're talking about the body of Christ. So when they call a place a church, they're perverting the word. But that's not surprising because that happens every day in many other things when it comes to the world. But the church, the body of Christ, is supposed to be different. We are Everything we do is supposed to be for the edification of the body. Perfecting the saints, work of the ministry, edifying the body of Christ. So now that we have sort of dispelled the myth of the modern day church, um, and I guess I can do a more in-depth <clears throat> study of that, uh, because I know that that uh, previous little section about uh, why churches are not pleasing to God in this era uh, probably alienated a lot of people, if anybody's listening to this. Um, I'm more than happy to do a study with that. I would love to study that, um, and if anybody had any questions about that, I'd love to get in contact with them and talk to them about it personally because uh, this specific issue has caused me a lot of pain uh, in my life because I've taken a stand on it based off of what I've seen in the Word of God, and other people were not so happy about that stand, and they uh, have caused me a lot of suffering. Uh, because of it um, and so I see it as a real challenge for people to accept that but the goal of this little Bible this little journal time is not to elaborate on an in-depth topic of that magnitude because that is a pretty big one I'd say that's probably the leading uh, cause of false doctrine um, the leading cause of Basically, it's the top spiritual war that's going on right now. It, attack on the church is just a false concept of what the church is and what the role um, of members and a pastor is in the church. And it's not at all based off of truth. Um, hopefully by now, if people have listened to more than one of these journals, you can get a better grasp of what our job is. Um, but let's take a step back from that because I don't want to spend a whole lot of time going into that because I want to keep this. I mean, it's already like almost 30 minutes, but I want to wrap up pretty soon. I don't want it to just go on and on. Um, so, as individuals, what does this mean for us? Well, we are members of the body of Christ, period. Um, and we have looked time and time again at what we are supposed to do as far as meat and how we're, we have liberty and we can become all things to all men. So if a lost person is doing something, um, we can, in all liberty, in all good conscience, usually do s stuff with them, do things similar to them, but do it as to the Lord. Uh, and not as to our flesh, and not as to please them. We're pleasing them for their good to edification. Uh, and the same thing sort of goes for uh, other people who are saved, or um, members of the body of Christ. Everything we do is supposed to be for edification. And it gets back to um, that verse that I just quoted, which is in First or Romans 15, uh, 2. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. And I guess this is the focus of what I was taking out of that uh, chapter in 1 Corinthians 14, is that at all times when we, it's not just what we do around other people, but even what we do on our own, we're supposed to be thinking as members of the body of Christ, how can I edify my neighbor? whether that person is saved, lost, saved and carnal, saved and trying to do its right. It doesn't, I guess it really comes down to believing or unbelieving is really all it is. Because an unbelieving saved person is basically the same as an unbelieving not saved person. An unbelieving person with the Holy Spirit in them is very not really any different than an unbelieving person without the Holy Spirit in them. It's just unbelieving person with the spirit in them has the spirit in them um, and an unbelieving person who doesn't have the spirit in them doesn't have the spirit in them and there are some 
other differences, but on the outward they appear the same, and on the inward they're very similar too, because um, in fact the one who has the spirit inside of them is probably much worse, because the spirit is grieved and it just makes them miserable at the time, because they know that they're doing something wrong, and they're destroying their second nature, their new nature, which is the new man created in Christ Jesus, and that's never going to make a person happy. Um, as if you could ever have happiness from vanity anyway. Anyway, so, but everything we're supposed to do is for edification. And we're always supposed to be, um, let's go to Ephesians 5. Well, that's the, that's partially the verse I wanted, but I think it was, yeah. So, we're supposed to be in Colossians 4, 5, walk in wisdom toward them that are out, them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. So we're supposed to be walking in wisdom, and we're supposed to be letting all of our things be uh, done and edifying. And we're supposed to be pleasing our neighbors for their good to edification. And so, we need to be remembering um, not just the way that we're treating each other, not just the way that we're speaking each other to each other, not just the way that we're behaving around each other, um, not just the way that we're behaving on our own when we think nobody else sees, not just the way that we talk on our own when we think nobody else sees, not just the way that we uh, do anything, but also you know, what type of things we're thinking. What are our goals? Is it, are we doing this because we want to satisfy the flesh or because we want to edify someone else? And truly our focus needs to be to edification and not for some other end. Um, it says in Philippians uh, 2, Four, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to the equal of God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, and things in the earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And it goes on, and I mean, we could read anywhere really and see just the constant focus on us taking upon us a servant serving each other it just keeps coming back to following the example of christ and esteeming others better than ourselves laying down ourselves for them to serve them to edify them in love to build them up um and that's what it comes back to is love walking in love like we looked at last week um so you know, it's just a challenge every day to be wise, walk circumspectly, you know, looking. How can we edify? And are we trying to edify or are we just walking as sleep? Because those who are asleep are just only concerned about satisfying themselves. They're just completely caught up. They can't even think clearly. You're just completely caught up in the path that you know, your body wants to take, the path that, you know, the course of the world wants to take you on. We've got to walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, and seek that we may excel to the edifying of the church. We can't just let things happen. We have to actually seek to excel to the edifying of the church. So, um, that's what I get out of 1 Corinthians 14.